Welcome back for the fifth installment, the fifth lecture in our series. Um, for those of you who've been here the whole time, of course, we uh, started off with an overview of the future of the American Space Program and, and where we're going. Uh, and then we followed that up with our two lectures about our transportation system, which is what we're working on right now. We have money to do that and funding to do that, and that's happening today across the country. And then last week we talked to you about uh, one of the um, one of the two really tough problems. I sometimes say miracles that have to happen for us to pull this off, and that was landing. Uh, uh, human scale payloads on the surface of Mars through the really poor atmosphere that Mars has. Um, and today we're going to hear from Dave Moore and Martha Cloudsley about how we're going to attack the problem of the effects of radiation on, on astronauts. So it's a long trip to Mars and Mars doesn't have the same protections that we enjoy here on Earth from our magnetic field. Um, and so we have to come up with ways to protect astronauts on the way and while they live on the surface of Mars. And you got two of the two of the best experts here this morning and I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Can can y'all hear me? Okay, good. Um, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, we're going to you know, give you all a briefing on the radiation protection efforts that we're, we're on going now over at NASA. Um, as most of y'all are aware, the effects of radiation here on Earth, you know, how it can affect our uh, you know, power grids, our water system, our uh, cell phone service, the airline industry. But uh, as we move further away from the Earth's protective magnetic field, there, there's uh, issues with protecting the astronauts and their, their safety. And you know, as, as Steve mentioned, we're looking at missions that could go anywhere from uh, two to three years. So we're, uh, we're working on processes and you know, to protect the astronauts going forward. Okay, right, thank you. All right. Um, as Steve also hit on, uh, I guess this is, we're the fifth in the installment, and you guys have probably already seen our kind of our uh, flow chart, how we, we pr propose to get to Mars. And, uh, and what I want to take away, what you take away here over in the far right, you see our missions, you know, two to three years. So we have a, you know, a, a big effort ongoing in the agency uh, to address that, the, 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 the top pole problem with space radiation. Um, to give you a kind of perspective of uh, what uh, you know, prior uh, astronauts have seen for exposure in space, you, you can see on the graph here of the, the other human missions, you know, the Mercury's and the Gemini's. And what I want you to you know, focus on is over on the right, you see the Mars, uh, the little box over from Mars. We're looking at you know this, this exposure that, that we're ex expecting the astronauts to see is a factor of uh, 10 greater than what anybody's ever received cur currently in flown. So this is a big problem for us and we're, we're spending a lot of effort trying to address it. Um, to give you uh, another uh, perspective and put it in context of what we see here on Earth, you start on the, uh, the line there, the log line, you see over here in the far left, if you would go get, get an office visit, you get a chest x-ray or a mammogram, the kind of exposure you get. And then as we move further to the right, you see a commercial airline pilots, you'll see it maybe a factor of 10 greater exposure. And then as we move one step further over into the what ISS realm, the astronauts there are seeing a, a, like a, a thousand times greater than what we see here on Earth. But then if you move over where we're proposing to go, Mars, in a three-year mission, we're seeing something like 10,000 times greater than what we currently see on Earth. We're very blessed to have the Earth you know, shielding protecting us, magnetic fields. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Martha and she's going to give you a briefing on the environments that uh, the, the astronauts are subject to and some of the uh, risks that they have to endure and then uh, she'll turn it back over to me and I'll, uh, and I'll give you a briefing on some of the mitigation ex efforts that we're doing here at Langley. So I'm going to try in a very few minutes to explain why we're worried about space radiation. There's really three types of environments we're worried about. There's galactic cosmic rays, which are heavy ions that are out there all the time. There's solar particle events, which are isolated events but can provide a very large dose. And then there's radiation that's trapped in the Earth's geomagnetic fields. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each of those. 
Uh, galactic cosmic rays are highly charged energetic nuclei that enter our solar system from outside the solar system. It's modulated by the solar wind. So we have an 11 year solar cycle and it will go from more intense to less intense, but it's always there. It, it's about a factor of two, it varies from uh, solar max to solar min. Uh, it, the galactic cosmic rays, it ranges from protons all the way up to much heavier ions like carbon, um, aluminum, gold, iron. Uh, and there's a huge range in energy from just a few EV to tens of GeV. So, you know, the heavier, the, the faster ones are moving at speed of light and, and just very, very penetrating. So that's our problem. So you don't get enough dose from galactic cosmic rays to worry about it for short missions. So it was never a, a problem for the Apollo missions. You know, they were there for a few days, didn't get enough exposure. But for these longer duration missions, you're getting enough dose, so you're getting, we're, we're worrying about increased risk of cancer especially. Um, so it becomes a, a shielding problem for the three-year Mars mission. Is something we, we just can't actually close on it. We can't provide enough protection right now. Question. Yes, yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in a few slides. But the question was, do the rays, can they affect the human DNA? Would they break the DNA strand? And the answer is yes. So solar particle events, unlike the galactic cosmic ray environment, which is always there, solar particle events are, are isolated events. They uh, correspond to um, coronal mass ejections from the sun, though the way they relate is... is um, not always intuitive. So you can have a big coronal mass ejection and not have a big solar particle event or vice versa. So it, it's, it's really hard to predict. And, and Dave's gonna talk a little more about that in a bit. Um, really large events that would provide significant risk to astronauts are pretty rare. We see one or two for 11 year cycle. But a large event that caught astronauts on EVA without protection on extra, on spacewalks, would, um, would be a challenge, would, it could be a real health risk. So uh, the one thing that's good about solar particle events is that it's mostly protons. And they range in energy again from a few EV, this time to about 1,000 MeV. So they don't go quite as high as the uh, GCR. Shielding is much more effective for them. So the, the point is that we have to get astronauts in a place where they're shielded. It, it, it's a solvable problem, but we need to make sure that we address it. And trapped radiation, we're not going to talk a whole lot about that because we're mostly focusing on exploration missions that go beyond the Earth's magnetic field. We're mostly worried about that mission to Mars. So, uh, but I did want to mention it because it is another source of space radiation and one that astronauts have been exposed to. Uh, what happens is that protons and electrons especially, and a few other particles, but mostly protons and electrons, get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field lines. And they basically, they, they swirl around the field lines and they just follow the field lines back from pole to pole, and they're always there. Um, the space station is at a pretty low orbit, so it doesn't go through the worst of the Van Allen belts, which is why the astronauts are relatively safe. It does sort of pass through them on each rotation and you get a proton dose as that happens. So they do get some dose from this. The magnetic fields also provide protection to us on Earth and to the astronauts on ISS. The lower energy galactic cosmic ray particles are actually, you know, their path gets deterred. Um, so they provide a lot of protection to Earth. Okay. Just backing up, what are, what are these charged ions we're talking about? And for those of you who remember your high school uh, chemistry class, this picture might look familiar. Uh, so just remember what an atom is. An atom is basically a nucleus surrounded by electrons. Now this picture is not at all to scale. Okay. The entire atom is about 10,000 times bigger than the nucleus. So. Um, most of, this, most of the volume of the atom is the electrons rotating, and the nucleus is very small and very, very tightly packed. Now, the electrons are neg negatively charged, and you have an equal number of positively charged protons in the nucleus, and those are bound together with neutrally charged neutrons. Uh, so the nucleus is made up of neutrons and protons packed tightly together, and then you've got orbiting electrons. So when we talk about how shielding works, uh, picture your aluminum wall, which is between the astronauts, and yeah, this is a really old graphic, I know, but the astronauts are on the inside of the vehicle, the space radiation environment starts out on the outside of the environment. You get 
tightly packed nucleus of protons and um, electron, uh, pro protons and neutrons, which impact the wall. Now the wall, again, most of the volume is the, those electrons, and then every so often, every so often on a very miniature scale, you have a nucleus. So mostly what happens is these particles moving through the wall, they're positively charged because they've been stripped of all their electrons. So they're trying to grab an electron from the atoms making up the shielding wall. And it slows down as they do that. So the particles coming in are slowing down. And then every so often they bump into a nucleus of the shielding wall, aluminum or whatever it is, and they'll break up. And secondary particles will be produced. It is possible that the environment behind the shielding will be worse than the environment outside the shielding. If you picture some heavy ions here and they come through the shielding and now you've got protons and neutrons being produced and more and more particles being produced. Um, so we have to be really careful in how we work shielding that we don't actually make it worse. Uh, permissible exposure limits. How much radiation are the astronauts allowed to get? We have several kinds of limits. We have 30-day limits. 30-day limits are basically a threshold value. You don't want to get more than this amount of radiation to avoid things like um, radiation sickness. And it's basically what you're worried about is the astronaut um, being on a spacewalk when a solar particle event happens. As long as they get to protection before the solar particle event happens, the 30-day th limits don't come into um, play. We also have career limits for some specific effects, circulatory system, central nervous system. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about those. The big challenge for us is this requirement that risk of exposure-induced death be less than 3% and that we ensure that at a 95% confidence level. And we're going to talk more about why that 95% confidence level uh, statement is there. But what this means is, you know, we all have a risk of, of dying of cancer. Um, the astronaut's risk of dying of cancer due to the exposure they're getting should be no more than 3% more than average Joe Americans. Um, the other thing is uh, radiation exposure should be kept as low as reasonably achievable. And this is the Alera principle. And it sounds like really squishy words. You know, you guys go do the best you can. Okay, but it's, it's actually a really important requirement because what this requires is that every time we send an astronaut in space, we need to do all of the trade studies to ensure that we've done everything we can to keep them safe. So you need to look at your vehicle and is there a way you can redesign it and evaluate each possible way you can redefine it. You need to look at your mission ops plan for when they're gonna be doing spacewalks and basically test each one and figure out what's the best way to keep the radiation exposure as low as reasonably achievable. It's a very important requirement for us. So again, why are we so worried about this space radiation environment and why do we have this insured at a 95% confidence requirement? Uh, so the space radiation, as we said, it's, it's protons but it's also heavier ions and it's basically different than anything that humans have been exposed to. We have a very limited number of astronauts that have had some extensive time on ISS that have been exposed to a somewhat similar environment but the low energy particles are pretty much cut off at ISS because the magnetic field protects them. So we don't have any population of humans that have been exposed to a lot of heavy ions. There's no way for that to happen on Earth. So most of our risk estimates are based on atomic bomb survivor data. So we're extrapolating from a totally different type of radiation um, and a totally different population with a totally different diet than people were eating back then. Uh, so there's a lot of extrapolating going on. If you look at this picture on the right, which might be a little bit confusing, what this is is this is the path of different types of particles through a material. Um, hydrogen protons are on the left. Helium are just a little bit heavier. And then as you move to the right, it gets heavier and heavier all the way over to iron um, ions. This is sort of the path they carve through the material. So the iron is bigger. It's basically just clearing a bigger path so it would be causing more damage to your DNA. And it's shooting off more delta rays, the sort of the scattered look or delta rays coming off the particle, which also can cause damage. So again, the problem is that we haven't had humans exposed to this, so how do we estimate their risk? Even if we can calculate perfectly how much radiation they're seeing, how do we estimate their risk? And the way we're working this is um, by doing more and more animal testing in heavy ion beams, but it takes time. 
So your question about DNA. These are uh, just, you know, diagrams. Here is an intact DNA strand. And up here you see, you know, if an X-ray would come through, it might be able to do damage to one very, very small part of that DNA strand. However, a heavy ion has the ability to break both strands of the DNA, and it's shooting off delta particles, which are doing more damage. So a heavy ion has the ability to affect this DNA strand so that it can't repair itself, which actually wouldn't be the worst thing. If, the DNA, you know, if, you, if you kill a few cells, we've got lots of cells. It's when they repair themselves in a bad way that we end up with cancer. Um, so there's three things that can happen. You can have a single strand break where a particle goes through one strand of the DNA, and those sometimes repair themselves correctly. You can have a double strand break, and this is a problem because they can come back together the wrong way. And now you've got a mutated cell, and if that mutated cell propagates at some point, you've got cancer. Or you can have chemical changes to the DNA. All of these are big worries, but the double strand breaks that you see with heavy ions is really our greatest concern. Okay, so how do we calculate astronaut risk? There's a bunch of different parts that go into that. We have to be able to evaluate the space radiation environment. And I showed you plots of what the GCR environment looks like. We actually have a pretty good fix on that. It's not perfect on any given day, but we have a pretty good fix on what types of particles are there and what energies are there. We need a radiation transport code to count calculate how that environment changes as it goes through aluminum shielding or whatever kind of shielding and as it goes through human tissue. I mean, your body is providing shielding to your internal organs. We need models of the shielding. We need models of the vehicle. We need models of the human body. Um, all of those things have some error associated with them in the way we do it now. It's small, but, but we don't have it perfect. Okay. Once you've done that, though, and you, know the, you actually know the exact radiation that's being absorbed by your liver and by your, all of your internal organs, we need to be able to figure out what biological risk that poses. Um, so we need radiation quality factors that take into account the fact that one type of particle is much more damaging to humans than another. We need tissue weighting factors which take into account the fact that one type of tissue is much more sensitive to radiation. You're much more likely to get one kind of cancer than another. And we need radiation coefficient factors to convert to risk. And we need dose and dose rate reduction factors. When we test things in the lab, we give it a lot of dose really quickly. Whereas the GCR environment, you know, as I said, you have to be out there for quite a while before it becomes a problem. It's a much more slow dose that you're getting. All of these, we have significant uncertainty with those. So there's our problem. You know, if we don't know really reliably what that quality factor is, how do we tell the astronauts what their risk is? And that's where that requirement that we re ensure that astronauts get no more than a 3% risk of exposure-induced death is um, ensured at 95% confidence. This uh, probability distribution function may or may not be confusing looking, but the red line could represent our best guess at the astronaut's risk. So you take the, your, you know, the best environment model we can come up with, you use the best transport codes, you use the best models for the vehicle, you calculate the organ doses, you convert that to risk using the best quality factors you have. However, if the quality factor is a little higher, this is another estimate. If the quality factor is a little lower, this is another. If the dose rate factor is a little higher. So all of these black lines represent possible answers for the same exact mission, how, risk, how much risk is the astronaut really seeing. So if we want to ensure that the astronaut has no more than a 3% risk of exposure-induced death and a 95% confidence, we have to provide shielding that gets us way over here on this plot. And that's where we end up with a mission that doesn't close. We don't know how to provide that much protection for a three-year mission to Mars. And it's something we're still all actively working on as fast as we can. Um, so let, let's talk about shielding materials. Uh, most vehicles are made out of some sort of aluminum alloy, though there's a lot of plastics involved in current vehicles, in, in the internal structure and, and, of course, the things you bring, food, water. Uh, but anyway, aluminum is not a great shielding material. These plots are, are effective dose to the astronaut versus shield thickness. So you can see you're getting a much greater reduction in materials that have a hydrogen content. Polyethylene water, pure hydrogen would be even better, but it's really hard to build a vehicle out of pure hydrogen. Um, so, 
Uh, anyway, so one thing to note is that materials with hydrogen provide better shielding for the same amount of mass. Uh, so when we can, we want to use those types of materials. Uh, the other thing to note from this plot is, you know, on the left you've got one for galactic cosmic rays, and on the right you've got one for solar particle events. The plot on the right, this is a log scale. So as we said before, shielding solar particle events is much more effective. You're getting a significant reduction in dose here by adding a little bit of shielding. Over here, you're getting much less reduction in dose by adding shielding. So we can pretty much shield SPEs. We just need to make sure it happens. Galactic cosmic rays is a whole other issue. The other thing to see about these three plots, or these two plots, is that the, the plots are leveling off. You know, add a little bit of shielding, you're getting a good amount of reduction. Then you keep adding more and more shielding, and you're getting a lot less bang for your buck. And I know you've heard the previous speakers talk about how every pound, launching every pound, is a problem. We, you know, the goal is absolutely to minimize mass. And here we're adding more and more mass and getting very little reduction in dose. So that's our, that's our problem. That's our challenge. Um, here's some calculations for how many safe days in space astronauts have before they reach that 3% risk of exposure-induced death calculated in 95% confidence. And there's some assumptions that went with this calculation. If you had different assumptions, you'd get slightly different numbers, but it gives you a real feel for it. In this case, the astronauts were in a 20 gram per centimeter squared aluminum um, vehicle. So think Mork's egg. It was just a spherical, spherical vehicle for these calculations. Um, two things to note. Well, the big one is that no matter what assumptions you make and which astronauts you send, we're looking at less than a year before they reach that 3% risk of exposure-induced death with the 95% confidence. Okay. The other thing to note is that um, males can stay longer before they reach it. And that younger people, females or males, can stay longer than older people. Uh, the other way around. Older people can stay younger than long... Younger people have greater risk. Excuse me. So. Uh, Right now, this is the NASA model, the 2012 model. So these are the numbers you would use. Um, the right-hand column is a new model that people are looking at. You know, basically, our astronaut population is a very healthy group of people. If we assume that none of them have ever smoked, which is a pretty close to real assumption, um, you get they have a lower risk of cancer, so they could maybe stay a few more days. Um, but none of these models are showing that you can stay for three years. So again, this is our problem. So what are we going to do about the problem? Well, basically, we're going to attack it from every angle we can. And what's not shown on here, but was mentioned at last week's meeting, for those of you who are here, so I want to bring it up, the absolute best thing we can do is get there faster. Astronauts stay a shorter amount of time. They get less radiation exposure. They have less risk. So if there's a propulsion breakthrough that allows us to go to the Mars and back faster, that, that is the best answer. And I don't have that on these charts because those of us in the radiation community aren't really working that part of the problem. Um, so there are four ways that we can attack it. The first is um, radi radiobiology and biological countermeasures. Reducing that uncertainty will definitely help. You saw how much of an effect that has. And if we can find some way to give astronaut medications or find some way to help with that radiation, that will be great too. Um, forecasting and detection. We've got to make sure those astronauts get into shelters the minute the SBEs are happening. Uh, shielding materials and configuring vehicles better is a big part of it. And there's a possibility that active shielding will be part of our solution. So we're just working them all at the same time and trying to together come up with a solution that works. I'm going to talk about the radio radiobiology and biological countermeasures briefly and then hand back off to Dave. Um, so as we showed on our probability distribution function, we've got about a 450% uncertainty associated with astronaut cancer risk. So if we can reduce that, possibly they can get more dose and still stay under that 3% risk of exposure-induced death. So that is really a big, big part of our goal. We have current models showing, our current models completely rely on atomic bomb survivor data, and that's a problem. We need more data related to um, heavy ions. We have some evidence that heavy ions have a different effect on humans. We're seeing um, earlier tumor growth and more aggressive tumor growth in animals that have been exposed to heavy ions. 
Um, so this is something we're really worried about, and NASA does support uh, an extensive biological experiment program. Okay, as far as radio protectors and mitigators, this work is really in its infancy. And if we had this all pinned down, we would have solved the cancer problem. You know, the NIH could come to us, we could tell them how to solve it. So it, it is a really challenging problem, but, but it is being worked. Um, a couple of focuses, they're looking at biomarkers that um, would predict uh, radiation diseases earlier, so then we could get people to treatment earlier, which might reduce uh, the chance of dying of cancer. Um, hopefully this will allow us to get earlier treatment, and it may, in the future, allow us to actually do personal risk assessments. So instead of talking about female astronauts that are 35 years old as compared to female astronauts that are 45 years old, we can talk about astronaut Dave Moore and, you know, have a complete model of Dave Moore's body and a complete model of Dave Moore's risk that includes all of his risk factors from his previous life experience. Um, that's a long way off, but that is the goal. Um, and uh, so... Just uh, one picture, we're really proud of our um, space radiation laboratory up at NSRL. This is, um, it's a laboratory at Brookhaven National Lab, so we basically partner with them. We use our, their beam lines, um, but we have our own facility on their center. Um, uh, Brookhaven is a Department of Energy facility. So this is the beam line. You basically accelerate particles faster and faster, and then it comes shooting down the line into our facility, and we can put... Um, cell cultures in the line, we can put small animals in the line. The problem is it's a slow process. You saw the galactic cosmic ray environment is all kinds of different particles at all different energies. You've got to do one particle and one energy at a time here. So it's a big challenging problem, but we're working it. And I'm going to pass off to Dave who's going to talk about the engineering approaches. Questions? It's different ions. You have the same type of problem where you're extrapolating from a different... Um, the question was, what about data from Chernobyl and the Japanese meltdown and Three Mile Island? Don't we have some more data other than just atomic bomb survivor data? And the answer is you've got the same problem with Chernobyl where it's a different type of radiation. You also have much smaller populations, um, especially with the Japanese situation. So we don't have a whole lot of data to build models on. You had a question. It means creating a magnetic field. And uh, Dave will talk slight, a little bit more about that. Okay. Uh, he, the question was, what is active shielding? And the answer is Dave's going to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Um, question. I don't know the answer to that. We do know that there is significant bone density loss um, for missions, and I don't know where we are currently with studies about three-year missions, and, and um, so I, I can't answer that one. Question. Question is, would the astronaut's medical history, would his or her uh, Medic tendency to get cancer enter into it at all. Right now, we um, we keep track of all of their previous exposures because we have many astronauts who go up more than once, and that does enter into it. They use that to decide whether they can fly again. We do not have, um, we do not use um, specific. You know, your type of group is more likely to get uh, cancer than some other group. Not we don't. Uh, you know, there's, we, we had some evidence that women were more susceptible than men. We don't use that in deciding who gets to go at this point. Um, there's research looking at that, but we don't, we don't use that as a qualifying or disqualifying factor. And as far as specifically whose risk, how much risk individuals have, we're really not there with the science to be able to predict, you know, my risk being more or less than Dave's. Um, okay. Question. Delta radiation, um, I'm not sure I'm going to do a good job explaining it. As the particle goes through, it's basically other part, delta rays 
are emitting energy. So it's, it, you're passing near a nucleus and it's having an interaction that's causing that particle that's coming through to um, shoot off a delta ray. It's, it's, it's yes, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not doing a great job explaining that, but that's. Let's see if they clap when I'm finished. All right. <laughs> Another uh, area we're, we're working on integrated approach is uh, you know forecasting and detection. You know, it's pretty. Uh, can, can you, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you if you um, if you can forecast the occurrence of the event, you know that gives your astronauts that's much more warning, that much more time to go seek shelter, especially when an SPE is occurring. And then you also uh, you know, we're working on capabilities to improve our detection. Uh, possibilities and I'll, sh I'll show you here. Um, in the area of uh, space weather forecasting, um, there's a lot of um, uh, research and models being done that have, uh, you know, work on addressing the issue of forecasting and arrival time, when the event will actually hit, hit you and then what that dose will be and how long that event will occur. But that's all been up to the last few years been kind of researchy. But we've, we've got an effort ongoing now at Langley to uh, integrate that work into an operationals platform where we can have the, uh, the, the console operators on the ground or the astronauts actually in space have, a, have all this capability and knowledge right in front of a screen for them. It, it's, it's a suite of software we put together. As you can see on the, the graphic on the left, it kind of gives them a stoplight uh, chart. You know, red, green, or red's bad, green's good. It, it can give them uh, other features where they can go in and check on the, uh, the uh, duration of the event, when it's going to arrive, how it compares to other historical events that we've recorded data on. So this is uh, some work that we're doing in the area of space weather. Um, uh, to, just to go dig a little deeper in all, the all-clear forecasting area, we're hoping to uh, increase our, uh, our warning time capability. You know, current uh, state-of-the-art is you know, an hour or so. We're hoping to expand that from you know, four to a 24-hour window, and we're doing that in partnership with our uh, NOAA. And the, you know, the, the idea here, you know, like I mentioned prior, was to give the astronauts more time to, to seek shelter. But also this, this helps in the operations planning. Say you need to go outside your, your habitat to do some you know, maintenance or whatever. If you know that that day is going to be a good day to go out and do an EVA, this is, this is ideal for you. you, know, you the operators on ground can, for, and can plan the mission for the astronauts. Uh, what you see on the graphic on the right is a, an, an image of the sun. We have uh, numerous um, assets you know, circling the sun, recording data, measuring, you know, see, seeing activity, and working with our partners at NOAA, we can uh, identify the active regions, and then we take this data, run it through our analysis codes, and make these forecast predictions. Um, and uh, area of arrival times, uh, we're, we're again working with NOAA. Uh, you know, in, in this area, we're, we're making use of terrestrial weather. What we currently do, everybody here is familiar with the uh, hurricane forecasting. You've seen it all on the news and TV. Well, we're we're we're, we're following the same type of uh, logic and process. You know, with modern computers, you can now do massive amounts of simulations in a short period of time, and you know, play with you, many variables, and it'll help you. Uh, you know. I, I, idealize when that event will hit you and occur. And you can see on the graph on the left there, it's sort of like tracking a hurricane. As, as the event gets closer to land, you know, our, um, our, our prediction capabilities are better, but as we extend further out, our uncertainties grow. But we're working to minimize that. And you, you, I think you get that time there. I mean, if, if we can increase that arrival time estimate, you know, that gives that astronaut that just more time to, to seek shelter. All right, um, in the area of uh, environmental monitoring, we've got a, quite a bit of work going on there too now. Um, and what you see here is a RIM, a radiation environmental monitor. This is actually flying on ISS. The, you know, the, we've, in a prior, uh, you know, I guess this, this too is new technology within the last few years. We've uh, been able to miniaturize it. Uh, before it was more bread box size and mailbox, and now we've been able with modern you know, improvements in computer power, been able to bring it down into a thumb drive size. So what you see here in the graphics is the, uh, the thumb drive inserted into a, a portable laptop, and you see the astronaut inside uh, one of the U.S. labs up in, on the ISS. Uh, this, this capability, as it progresses, will have these, we were forecasting, you know, we'll have these embedded inside the, the, the structure of the habitat itself. So it'll be real-time monitoring. 
This gives the, um, it's just another way to give the astronaut an indication of what the exposure is he's currently seeing and maybe some warnings that, you know, hey, things aren't going well, so you go seek Seltzer. Um, in the area of our particle spectrometers, it's another detector. We just uh, recently, I think you all probably aware, we flew a, uh, a Curiosity rover that's currently up on Mars. Well, this, uh, this piece of uh, detective equipment was embedded inside the rover. And so this gives us um, real-time estimates of what the, uh, the radiation environment is on Mars. But also, this, this provided us data on a, a, a transit to Mars, you know, a, a flight, you know, leaving Earth and taking the six to nine months it takes to get to Mars. This gave us a, a, a good understanding of what, what, what we would see, how many SPEs would occur, and what the you know, daily radiation at GCR environment was. It's very low mass and low power and it's doing a great job. I mean, we're, we're still receiving data daily on this that the, the modelers on Earth can use to help you know, improve their, their models. Um, next, we're gonna talk about shielding materials, uh, you know, the use of passive shielding. Uh, Martha talked, uh, you know, showed a few charts about the different materials and which ones are better to use. So we're trying to take that, uh, that knowledge and integrate it into our, our future habitats and how to do a better job of uh, providing you know, shielding on the capsules. Um, you can see here in this graphic, um, you know, everything is in play. If we can do a better job of the, the shell structure material, uh, you know, instead of aluminum, maybe some uh, composite you know, would be structure. Maybe the secondary structure the same way, uh, and also the equipment that's inside the habitat. Anything to give them more hydrogen-based you know, shielding materials will, will improve the, uh, the, the stay of the astronauts and give them that much better protection. Um, Another area that we we're looking at, you know, um, is when, say we get to Mars, uh, maybe we can make use of the, uh, the uh, regolith, which is another fancy, fancy word for Mars dirt. What, maybe we can make use of the dirt that's there, the topsoil, and, and, and take our habitat, either, uh, as you see on the right, encapsulate ourselves with, you know, put a large amount of this around our habitat, or seek a, a cave or a, a lava tube and, and put your, embed your uh, habitat in there, and t just take use of the, uh, the surface protection that's available. Um, uh, next, you know, we talk about, you know, we talked about the passive materials. Now, uh, another area in that area is uh, configuration optimization. Maybe doing a better job of laying out your equipment, your subsystems, and you know, around in your in your your habitat, uh, this is an effort that uh, has got a lot of uh, work just done now. Uh, before the habitat, as you, let me back up here a minute. You can see on the left here the habitat focus. If um, if we just let the designers, you know, without a, a radiation perspective, design it, you would you envision that this, you know, they would put it ergonomically like you'd like to set up in your office or your home. But if you had uh, you have an eccentric radiation focus, you're going to see a, like a little incoom fort like you would build in your parents' living room when you were little. So, so there's this dynamic that's always going on amongst the designers and the analyst folks. So we're, we've got a collaborative effort now going now in the agency to, to work together. And so they, you know, they bring in the Marthas and, you know, into the, the habitat design and, and try to see if we can do a better way of uh, placing what we have up, as grow up. Um, along those lines, uh, there's an effort that I oversee here at Langley uh, for designing uh, protection systems for SPEs. And we call this reconfigurable logistics. When you're, when you're in transit to Mars, there's no phone home or a supply ship coming right behind you. So you have to make use of everything you have on that capsule at that time. So that includes your water, your food, even your trash. I mean, everything is in play. Everything has to have a secondary purpose if you want to make use of the total mass to give you that protection. So it, you see over in your left slide there, you know, just a, a typical cargo bag. So we worked with the, uh, the people down at Johnson in operations and said, hey, how about if we add a few zippers here and uh, you know, have this so it unfolds and turns into a drape, a curtain, so we could mount this on one of the um, racks and a uh, typical rack and hang you know, mass structure on there to provide uh, shielding for the astronauts. Just something simple, but uh, you know, everything, you gotta think outside the box. And so what you see on the right here is um, in our labs, we were, did a bunch of um, uh, humans in the loop, uh, human factor type analysis. You know, it, it does us no good to come up with these shielding ideas and the astronauts say, this is 
this is bull. You know, and this won't work. Uh, this is not. <laughs> this is not practical. So um, we do a lot of uh, humans. You know, get a lot of. You know, we bring people in in the lab there, and we give them a set of instructions. We time them. We ask them about the difficulty. We do a lot of. Uh, you know, trying to figure if if it's practical to to do. And, and here, see here. I was going to say. Uh, I was, I'll still say. You know, this is what. Uh, this is prior to me and Martha starting the task. This is what we used to look like, <laughs> but much younger. Yeah. Another area we're looking at um, is making use of water. Water is a great shield. You know, it's hydrogen it, it content is high, and so uh, we, um, we we have a lot of contingency water on the um, on on our missions. So uh, the idea is here. Maybe we can take that water, and if we can move it from point A over to point B in a relative bit of time, we can provide that much extra protection to the astronauts. So our team, we looked at uh, maybe we could retrofit a uh, crew quarters. The, the astronauts spend a lot of time in there, you know, they sleep in here. This is where they go to interact with their families, like the little private space. So uh, we, we, we looked at um, maybe adding some water bladders and what, you know, what, what would be entailed to, for plumbing, you know, actuators and valves to move water in a, in a over and to provide that temporary shielding with the idea that this would be temporary. It gives them the shielding to the event passes. The event can last maybe a day to a day and a half, and then we would move that water back to where it was originally supposed to be. Um, on the area of uh, personal protection, you know, uh, we, we really don't have a habitat concept in place yet. We, we're, everything is, you know, going that way, but we, ha we don't have a design yet. So we were looking at, well, what, what could we do in the meantime? So this is an area where we look at maybe we can, this can be portable and go to any habitat design you come up with, but this will also be a personal wearable. So you can see over on the left, the, um, the, the astronaut candidates wearing this little uh, vest. You know, the idea here is you, you pack this full of uh, you know, polyurethane or maybe water, or you can insert food, anything to give you that mask, to give you that person, the extra protection. And, Sorry, was there a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, we, uh, this one is designed to protect the vital organs. Uh, do you, I don't. You would probably want a helmet to go with it in protection from the lenses. But this covers where the bone marrow is most prevalent. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we, we have done some work in that area of uh, giving them a, a cover and all, and we, we have some pictures in our labs, and it's, it's very uh, popular on the tours. Everybody wants to get their picture made next to this, <laughs> this mannequin. But, uh, yeah, we have looked at that, and it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, uh, sleeping. The astronauts, when they, are, they sleep in space, they're, they're sleeping in what they call a sleep restraint. It's actually a, you know, mounted, Velcro mounted to their sleep area, and it, you know, that's so they won't float around while they're asleep. So we looked at areas where I mean, we could uh, retrofit a sleeping bag you know, contraption that would wrap around them and tomb them, and then you know, use the same logic as the vest, pack it full of food, water, whatever, to, to give them that extra protection. All right. Okay, I've got a movie here. I'll show you. This kind of brings everything into perspective. What we were, I was, the prior slides I was just showing you, but um, you know, I think this will help explain a lot better. I'll, I'll, it's a, I'll tell you a few things. I'll highlight a few items. Is that better? Okay. Well, you know, here's a you know an artist rendition of a, a warning. You, you see something occurs on the sun. It gives the astronaut a you know, real time. You know, Got to go seek shelter. The event is arriving, and then um, we transition into here. We're we're, we're looking at uh, you know, retrofitting uh, crew quarters. This one is the wall to wall design. simple as turning a valve. In our lab, we have actually have a, 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 like iPads, and we do it all automated. We can you know, move it through our suite of software. We can move the water into and out. This is on the lines of uh, reconfigurable logistics, you know, moving mass that's stationed in a different part of the capsule or your habitat over into where you need it to, to provide you that temporary shelter. Gives you kind of an idea of what, what what's involved to do that, because you wouldn't want this this protection mass, you know, just sitting around. You want it to be portable and, and put away.
here's an you know, visualization of the, uh, the, the bags, you know, the zipper unfolding. And what you see here in these white tiles is a, uh, an effort we have going on to uh, make repurpose the trash. Uh, currently, you know, you have all, as you eat your way through the mission, you have all these byproducts, the trash. So there's an effort at uh, Johnson and Ames to compact the trash, burn it, and reprocess it, and turn it into shielding tiles. So if you get enough of these tiles, you can you know, add enough, you can get added protection. So that's the idea, you know, you consume it, you re reprocess it, and you turn it into shielding materials. Um, we have the astronauts here, you know, you can see they're in close quarters. We try to uh, double bunk them in, I mean, because you have limited amount of mass, so you, you try to get them as tight as you can, so you can get as much shielding between them and the, the exposure as possible. So they, you know, they would set in this uh, tomb here for uh, you know, a day, day and a half. They, they can go out as they need to to check vital systems, but they, they would spend the majority of their time hunkered down in these little mini forts. Yeah, there was no gravity. Yeah. People always ask about that. Do you want to be the one on the bottom or the one on the top? Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> is, that, is that a cue for me to speed up? <laughs> Here's the, uh, the, the drape idea. You know, we, we take out those folding bags. They can move these drapes, mount them to where they need to, you know, to mount for structure and shielding. Everything has a dual purpose. That's the, the takeaway here. What's that again? I'm sorry. What? Um, we, oh, it, it, we have uh, times, we, we try to get them to do it in like 30 minutes. That's the, one of the rules we shoot for, 30 minutes. The question was how quick can they uh, build these shelters? And the, we target 30 minutes. Well, we take that, uh, it, I don't know, have y'all ever seen space food, how it's packaged? We take that packaging and we, we, we burn it, compact it, and turn it into those protection tiles. So, yep, yeah, so everything is reused. Yes, ma'am. All right, um, the last item I'm going to hit on very briefly, uh, active shielding. Uh, that question was raised by the audience. Um, we, this, this work is in its very infancy. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, bang for your buck if we could perfect it, but uh, we there's a lot of uh, engineering issues we have to overcome to uh, to make it work. And uh, yeah, what, some of the items are, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, uh, the size of the magnets, how, how, what, what the required, the power, the, the, the structure, how much they are, the mass, how do we mount them to our, our, our capsule structure, there's a lot of uh, you know, engineering issues they have to overcome. But the idea is, you know, surround yourself like to create an artificial uh, magnetic field like Earth has. And, you know, the idea is the radiation comes in, it's repulsed, you know, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this right now. This is more a researchy realm. All right, I think that is the... They would be permanent. Yeah. Uh, is there any questions? Yes, sir. I'll have to turn that over to the Martha. Micrometeor type protection. You mean actual pieces of, that's a whole different area. Um, <laughs> Uh, it is very important, and there's a lot of research that goes on, especially at NASA Langley, about designing shields and, and spacing different materials so that they slow down those type of projectiles. Um, but that's not, not our area, I guess. Um, next question. No. Does, does Mars have its own protective belt like Earth? And then the answer is no. Yes, sir. This is sort of a basic, and I think it's a two-part question. <clears throat> My experience with the medical imaging community, I've been x-rays and so on years ago, those badges, the, 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 the quality of 
wanna, the dosimeters? Yeah, the dosimeter was called Renkins. Mm -hmm. That's changed now. Again, I think, I don't know what the terminology is now. They, uh, I think it's Sieverts, right? Is that the? And then, um, Dr. Klein, when you mentioned something else, you mentioned that in space, that's not analogous. You said that we have these high charge and energy ions, which are different from X-rays and gamma rays. We still talk about astronaut dose in terms of sievert. Is that what you mean by the unit? Yeah. Yeah. So dose is measured in gray, which is just energy deposited per unit mass. Um, however, there's another unit called dose equivalent, or which is measured in sieverts, which actually has um, a quality factor folded into it that accounts for the risks that these particles provide to humans. So two different types of particles can basically deposit the same dose, but provide very different risk to humans. So we use sieverts to be a measure of how much risk the humans have. So even though it's a, it's a different, it's, it's, it's not analogous to the, to the gamma rays and the x-rays, it's still the sieverts that have a different component in it? Well, sievert is how much dose equivalent astronauts are getting from any type of particle. Right. Yes. So basically you've got x-rays and gamma rays that you talk about here on Earth. In space we have charged protons, charged helium ions, and those which are our primary concern. And, but we measure astronaut risk from any of them in terms of sievert. Okay. A question. Yes, that is a, uh, one of the issues that we're trying to overcome, you know, the, the byproducts, the gases, the outgassing. Yes, that we are, you know, we, we've done this uh, on Earth, you know, but it's like we, 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 before we could ever fly this on a vehicle going to Mars, we'd have to demo it in like an ISS environment. There's no way that the, the, they would let us do that. And, yes, sir. Yes, that's, uh, I, I can briefly talk about that. There's a big uh, cost associated with rad hardening uh, electronics and equipment, and that, that would be all considered in anything you fly that far away from Earth and for that amount of time. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am, it takes uh, six to nine months to get there, but we, we, we'd like, we, we just don't want to go there and get there. We want to stay there. I mean, three years, yeah, three years, yeah. And maybe a, a year on the surface or, or around it, yes. Okay. yes. You, you talked in terms of using water balloons and bladders and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, the question was, can we make use of the water on the uh, surface of Mars if there you know, if there's appreciable amount of it? And the answer is yes. We would definitely want to use that. We, you, know, you saw this, the sketch I had with the regolith. You know, yeah, that could be some supplement. You could use water plus that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Would you? I don't. Yeah. Um. You also want water for the astronauts for any number of reasons that don't have to do with radiation. So there, there have been some engineering efforts for how you would get that water. One thing is the water's not everywhere, so you need to either plan your mission to be where the water is, or you can't rely on it as shielding. But there are there is work going on to to utilize the water on the surface of Mars. Yes, sir. Uh huh. I am told, okay, I'll, I'll. Almost not at all. So you asked about damage to materials from radiation. That's a very slow process. The reason humans have so much more of a risk is because if the particle comes in and damages 
the DNA, and then you get a mutated cell, and that mutated cell propagates, you can have cancer. If a particle comes through and damages one hydrogen atom within the water, you have a damaged hydrogen atom, but it, it doesn't have a way to propagate that damage through it. So you would need way more radiation than we're seeing in space. And I'll answer the next question before it comes. The same uh, answer for food, right? <laughs> I get asked that a lot. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, what provisions are you making in case somebody dies here that night? Uh, <laughs> 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 That's not an option. Failure is not an option. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, no, I, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, reuse them as shielding. <laughs> you get the point. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, are there any unusual radiation events that you've encountered in space that you think are unusual? All right, the, uh, I can answer the first question and I'll turn the second one over. The first question was uh, when we, the, we flew the mission to Mars with the rover, what, what did we see? Yeah. Uh, we, we saw, uh, I think we saw either three or four SPEs, the events that we can, we can design and shield against. So that was great knowledge. I mean, we, we did not, you know, that was the best we've had to date of what, what an actual transit to Mars would look like. So uh, that, that was great knowledge. And about the, uh, the medical question. I don't really have an answer either. But um, this is, so the question was, what, what can we do in terms of providing medical attention to help astronauts who've been exposed to radiation? And we have an ongoing research project looking at those. Again, you're sort of bordering on can we solve, you know, cure cancer. If we figure this out, we'll have solved lots of problems. Uh, but they're researching antioxidants, which you probably have read in any number of magazines, might um, improve your risk for, of getting cancer on Earth. Uh, but they're also looking at um, ways to basically tell the cell it's been damaged. You know, So basically, tell the cell to go ahead and kill itself, um, So rather than propagating. Um, but all of that's really at its infancy. We're, we're working it, but um, right now, we don't have good countermeasures for space radiation. Um. Yes, ma'am. Can I give you the microphone? <laughs> okay, regarding dying in space, yesterday morning I went online and logged into a, a website on YouTube called Ask a Mortician. It is real, it's conducted by a licensed mortician, and that was the first question that I encountered on there. And in essence, the body could be ejected into space and would be frozen, and there's a whole explanation as to orbiting and entering different gravitational fields, but should you come back to the planet Earth, the mortician said the body will enter at 17,000 plus miles per hour, and because it doesn't have a heat shield, <laughs> will be super cremated when it hits our atmosphere. So, but I would advise you to check into that. Ask a mortician. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next NASA employee. Uh, all right. Yes, sir. I don't think that we know that yet, do we? Uh, that question was, do we know the composition of the water on Mars? I don't think we know the answer to that. I think it's, it's we believe that it's similar to... Um, here on Earth. They actually have two kinds of ice on Mars. They have CO2 ice and they have water, H2O ice. And the H2O ice should be similar to what we have here, we think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I 
I think that's what last week's presenter said, but I'm, yeah. Any other? No. Yes, ma'am. Maven. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, help me out, Steve. You know what's on Maven? <laughs> I do. Maven is designed to help us understand why Mars lost its atmosphere. So it's going to study the composition of the um, atmosphere that's being torn away from Mars um, all the time at this point. <laughs> Is that it? That was some very good questions. Thank you all very much. Yeah, those were great questions. I'm thinking about how to get you guys on our design team so that uh, we can, uh, I know a lot of you actually worked at NASA, so of course we want you guys back. But um, I hope that the uh, last five weeks have uh, given you a sense of the excitement of the space program that, that we could have and uh, given you sort of brought you up to date on where we are. Um, I also hope that it gave you a good sense of how hard it is to do what we're trying to do. And I think that, uh, that I just want to reiterate the, the uh, importance of that fact. You know, Kennedy actually said this when he kicked off the Apollo program. He said, we do this because it's hard. And it kind of sounds like a simple statement. But because of the difficulty of what we're trying to do, we are going to reap tremendous benefits um, across many different aspects of society, from geopolitical to economic to social benefits and that's the that's the payoff of what we do uh, in the space program and and as we talked about last spring uh, that payoff is well over a hundred percent and all, and very low risk we we're almost we, we know from history that we get that payoff when we invest in the space program so I hope that uh, you've enjoyed it and um, we really appreciated uh, your interest and the questions and interacting with you over the past five weeks thank you <laughs>